Hey guys, today let's talk about Crossroads. Uh, for many of you like me, I think the Crossroads film was kind of like my Beatles on the Ed Sullivan. I remember my dad rented that VHS and we threw that on and the blues stuff was so legit and I was loving that. But holy crap, when it got to the Steve Vai, Jack Butler stuff, it, I mean, my head exploded. It was unbelievable. And I didn't know who Steve Vai was at the time, really. He was just this cool looking dude strutting around the stage playing like this unbelievable music. I kept thinking like, this guy's an actor. It's all bull because he's doing stuff. Look at his hands. He doesn't even have his other hand on the, the guitar while it's happening. Now, of course I know he's just doing like hammer-ons and like and Steve I can do that because Steve I could do anything um, and you know the the whammy bar stuff all this uh, I didn't even have an electric guitar at that time because you know what happened uh, that Christmas I got an electric guitar and I found it in my parents closet before Christmas and of course I didn't know really know how to play but I did know how to grab the whammy bar at the back and shake it like Vi does at the end and I broke a string and that was terrible in case you don't know it's this this maneuver <laughs> that movie to this day is still that scene of Ralph Macchio versus Steve Vai uh, it was so important to uh, my love of guitar the tones and the, the bluesiness and the classicalness and the the fire that was just coming off the stage. It was unbelievable. Let's dig a little deeper into the Jack Butler tones that happened in the Crossroads movie. The guitar that Jack Butler by, plays uh, is a Grover Jackson built Jackson. Uh, you could see the um, brand is sort of blackened out, sprayed over on the headstock, um, but Grover confirmed that he had built that. Uh, it's a maple neck. Believe that the pickups are PAF Pros. The filming of this happened, Steve I said he went off, got off tour and went in. I think it's right between sort of Alcatraz and David Lee Roth. It would fall right in that line, uh, that timeline. So uh, he certainly didn't have his gem guitars yet. It hadn't solidified into the Vi guitar that we know now. So the closest I have to that is my Friedman Grover Jackson built uh, guitar, which uh, I, I suspect is significantly different. Uh, the pickups certainly are. The, the Friedman pickups have a lot more um, sort of punch and bite uh, edge that, than a PAF Pro would, uh, although they still don't have a ton of output. It's kind of a mid-output. Uh, Floyd Rose, I really like the feel of it, and I, I'm loving the tremolo. Uh, this, the neck feels great. Maple neck. Uh, it's not red, but you know, we could use our imagination. Here. Bing. On the amp side of things, as you could see in the film, Vi is using a Carvin X100B half stack. This kind of burned into my, my psyche as like, this is cool. And I always wanted one, but no one else really used them. Frank Zappa and Steve Vai. Uh, Craig Chakiso from Jefferson Starship. There was not a lot of X100B users, which always seemed crazy to me that Steve Vai got one of the best electric guitar tones ever in Crossroads and no one else was using this amp. And then they got a lot of flack and Steve went on to use Marshalls later, Jose modded Marshalls, and then of course his, uh, went back to Carvin for the Carvin Legacy series. But sure enough, Steve used the Carvin X100B in the recording of Crossroads. The X100B is actually a pretty cool amp. It's 100 watts, uh, 6L6 power tubes. It has an incredible clean channel. It's very clean and very, uh, very rich. It's, it's quite nice. Um, it's channel switching. There's a mode that is awful. And then there's a mode that's pretty cool. <laughs> So 
it's not incredibly gainy. Uh, there's a very excellent graphic EQ, which is fantastic. So you could get crazy bottom end, but the bottom end on the amp already isn't very tight. So you kind of got to be careful and sort of work between the bass knob here. Uh, it turns out most of my settings are about five and I'm pulled out for high lead. Um, the graphic EQ, I'll show you where that setting is right now. Um, and I'll just kind of flip these real quick. And look how huge that gets on the 75 hertz uh, slider. Which for single note stuff... Still, there's not a lot of gain for leads there. Um, 150 hertz knob. A little bit of body, the 500 hertz knob. That's the gross frequency. Where you're just kind of dipping that a little bit. I'm bumping the 75 a little bit. 1.5 is sort of body. And 3K I'm pushing just a bit too. It's sort of the scratchy, but it adds some presence that I like. Uh, five setting in all the pictures was sort of flat across with a little bump at 1.5, which is kind of like this. I don't know, what if I turn up the bank? That actually sounds pretty good too. Yeah, it's really nice. And there's not much place to deviate really from this tone because uh, like I said, I'm on gain 10. <laughs> This is five. It's just kind of like a wimpier version of what you got. Let's go over to the clean channel. It's, it's really nice and clean. Um, Reverb's on eight. Now let's go on to the controversial dirty side. So if you just go to the lead drive and do not have the high lead engaged, it's pretty horrendous. Uh, it's just a puffy Ugh. It's a smooth kind of weird sound that I feel like I've heard in the 70s um, and you go like mm, that's not a good sound but uh, you know you turn it all the way up crank some EQ on. that. That's about it.
All right, so I'm back in the high lead mode here. So how did Steve Vai get these searing lead tones when the amp he was using could barely get over kind of ACDC levels of distortion? Well, it was with one of these. MXR Distortion Plus. Made famous prior to this by Randy Rhodes, who was known to use one of these too. Not the friendliest pedal of all time. Uh, they've been making them for ages now. They have block letters. This is one of the old ones. And it kind of sounds old. It's a little saggy. I don't know if it's uh, on its way out or not, but it kind of delivers this tone. So plug it back in. So this is raw amp. <laughs> Let's kick on the Distortion Plus. Sort of fills out the note. Gives it some sustain. Uh, but it does add like kind of a fuzzy characteristic to it. Still a little loose bottom. Uh, what I found interesting about this is that the X100B seemed to prefer, the cheaper the pedal, it just kind of sounded better. Let me switch over to DS1. And I, I don't, it's not often that I step on a DS1 and go like, yeah, I'm, I'm liking this. All right, back to the distortion. So if we're going to get more specific with the Crossroads guitar tone, uh, one of the things we have to look at is how it was recorded and where it was recorded. Uh, when I listen to it, I hear the guitar deep in a space, uh, which probably happened. I don't know if that was recorded as a group, but I mean, you have the great Jim Keltner on drums on, on those band tracks, which is incredible. Ry Cooter's there. I mean, it, the, it was an all-star uh, blues rock band. I incredible. And Vi certainly can pull it off, but I, I feel like he was so uh, prominent. They maybe did this as an overdub, which means you have an entire studio. In this case, it was Oceanway Studios, one of the best in the world. And you could put a guitar amp out in the middle of the room and it's going to sound glorious like absolutely there's nothing like a big 412 or several 412 multiple amps whatever screaming in a, a beautiful acoustic space it's incredible and that's kind of what i'm hearing and that's why i think in part it sounds so great so i tracked this dry uh let me play you a little piece of what that sounds like dry So the next thing I needed to do is add some space. So as luck would have it, his track was recorded at Oceanway, and there is an Oceanway plugin that simulates the space at Oceanway. Uh, fantastic. So I copy down one of the, the guitar mics into that, and I blend that up, and that sounds like this. Now you could tell at the end of his uh, phrases, there's a wash of reverb. And at the time, it was maybe a 480L, I'm guessing, that uh, 
was the big mothership reverb uh, around 86. So I'm going to throw on uh, from my lexicon uh, PCM 96, a large hall. That sounds like this. <laughs> And then there's other times in there, and this is part of the supernatural sound, which I've always loved, and I, I couldn't really pinpoint it until a little more recently in my uh, studio life, is I hear like an Eventide sort of effect. And around that time, I don't know if the H3000 was out yet, but they certainly had the uh, H910s, which is the predecessor, and people would use two of them, pitch one side up a tiny bit, pitch one side down a tiny bit, and it creates a chorus effect. Uh, essentially. Uh, they sometimes call that micro pitch. Uh, and that's a sound that you would hear a lot later uh, in Van Halen's. He went he went micro pitch crazy. Uh, Lukather uh, would do it. Vi ha has it on uh, some stuff. But uh, so let me just show you what that sounds like without the reverb. <laughs> All right, so now you put them all together and you get this. Thanks for watching. Hit like and subscribe if you would, and uh, because it's free.